Welcome everyone. My name is Michael Fuchs. And I'm Christoph Meyer. Today we want to present a bias T for broadband measurements of power electronic components. Bias T's are an important tool for many applications, including vector network analysis. There is a big of a variety of bias T's regarding their bandwidth or their DC currents. But when it comes to measurements of power electronic components, one quickly encounters the limits of the devices available on the market. Nevertheless, such measurements become increasingly important for the study of electromagnetic emissions and modeling of such power electronic components. In our case, for instance, we want to measure the impedance of a simple inductor or of a common mode choke over a wide frequency range at high currents with a vector network analyzer. We therefore need a special kind of bias T um, that can um, dig currents up to 10 amps or even 30 amps for a short while and they should work in the frequency range from about 10 kilohertz to 500 megahertz. We have here the basic structure of a bias T. For the measurement of a common mode choke with a vector network analyzer, we need four of them. Here you can see the device under test in the middle. The AC ports of the four T's are connected to the VNA, while the DC ports are connected to the DC voltage or current source. With this setup, we can make a small signal analysis of the device under test, while a constant DC current can flow through the windings of the common mode choke. We also want to use this bias T for other devices under test, like capacitors or even power MOSFETs. Therefore, the capacitor in the bias T should be able to sustain DC voltages of about 500 volts. Now let's take a closer look at the individual components of our BIOS T, starting with the capacitor. The capacitor should have a low impedance over the whole frequency range. If 2 ohms is set as upper impedance limit, we need about 8 microfarads at 10 kHz. The capacitor should also be able to sustain 500 volts DC. This constraint increases the mechanical size of the capacitor such that the upper frequency limit becomes a new challenge due to parasitic inductances. In order to obtain low RF losses in the RF path, we decided to use a distributed arrangement as can be seen here. We used a total of eight capacitors with one microfarad each that are placed in parallel. To ensure a characteristic impedance of 50 ohms, we used a microstrip line. On a 1.6 mm FR4 board, a 3 mm wide trace leads to the desired 50 ohms. Since the smallest available package of such a capacitor still has a width of 6 mm, we had to increase the distance to the ground plane a little bit. Therefore, we used a second layer of FR4. Two carefully tra designed transitions guide the RF signal from the 3 mm wide trace to the 6 mm wide trace. To ensure that our design works properly, we did a TDR measurement with a bandwidth of 14 GHz. We can see that the junction capacitance of the TVS diode we use for the protection of the VNA has a big influence on the characteristic impedance. This influence can be counteracted by changing the di diameter of the microstrip line at the point where the diodes are connected. We will discuss the whole protection concept a little later. Let's first move on to the design of the inductor. For the calculation of the necessary inductance value, 
a minimum impedance of about 50 dB ohm was aimed at. At the minimum frequency of 10 kHz, this results in a necessary minimum inductance of at least 2.5 mH. The higher the impedance, the more dynamic range can be achieved in the measurement. This would be easier if we could use um, core materials for the inductor like iron, but this is not possible due to saturation effects. This restriction leads to inductors which are rather large in size, which in turn is counterproductive for their RF performance. The high current carrying capability also requires rather thick wires, which again adds parasitics at high frequencies. In order to optimize the behavior at high frequencies, we used a conical shaped inductor coil. The tip of the coil was connected to the 50 ohm trace of the DC block of our bias T. The advantage of such a conical shape can be seen in this diagram. The conical shape improves the RF performance compared with a cylindrical shape with the same inductance. Up to the resonance, no differences are visible. However, after the first resonance, the conical inductor shows a series of resonances maintaining an average higher impedance relative to its cylindrical partner. The distribution of these additional resonances depends on details of the winding, the wire di diameter and the distance between the wires. These resonances have a threefold negative effect on the system performance. First, the anti-resonances may reach low impedance values, which requires strong correction during calibration. Secondly, even if they could be compensated by calibration, they must remain time invariant. If the geometry of the coil changes slightly during the measurements, for instance due to thermal reasons, this may move the resonances, which would require a new calibration. Thirdly, increased wire resistance due to heat could lead to an inaccurate correction during the measurement if the calibration would be based on high Q resonance. Therefore, we must dampen those resonances by deliberately introducing losses. Electrically lossy material is placed near the conical inductor, which will reduce the impedance at resonances and increase the impedance at anti-resonances. You can find a detailed description on how to calculate the inductance of such a conical coil in our paper. For this coil, we calculated an inductance of about 63 microhenry. To achieve 2.5 millihenry, this coil would need to be about three times as long. This enormous space requirement is one of the reasons we decided to add two other coils in series to this one. Another reason to use three separate coils is the protection concept. If a DC current path is suddenly interrupted while 10 amps are flowing through 2.5 millihenry inductors, the energy output would be about 130 microjoule, which would dissipate into the VNA and would certainly destroy it. To protect our VNA, we can use transient voltage suppressor diodes. If they are placed directly into the RF path, their capacitance needs to be kept small to avoid further disturbances in the RF path. We already saw the effect of big um, suppressor diodes at the beginning of our presentation. However, smaller diodes cannot handle the energy, which is why we have um, decided to do a distributed arrangement of those diodes over the indiv individual inductors. The high value inductors must store most of the energy, but their electrical function is limited to the lower frequencies. Thus, TVS diodes with larger capacitance of about 
100 picofarads can be used. Let's have a look at the complete schematic of our BIOS T. Here L1 represents the conical inductor. As we can see, no TVS diode is placed across it, while two TVS, TVS diodes are placed over the larger ones. We can also see two potentiometers which are used to dampen the resonances and increase the impedance at anti-resonances, just like the electrically lossy material um, on the conical inductor we saw before. Also, a capacitor and a resistor are connected in parallel to the largest inductor to further dampen the resonances. A second protection problem arises from the 1.1 joule stored in the DC block capacitors if the device under test is suddenly shorted to ground. In this case, 8 microfarads charged up um, to about 500 volt would be discharged into the VNA, which would definitely result in its sudden death. Therefore, a second level protection is needed. This is realized by placing polymer-based snapback devices from the RF path to ground. These devices offer very low capacitance of below 0.05 picofarads, fast turn-on times of about 0.1 nanoseconds, and they will clamp at about 25 volts DC. However, the amount of energy in the DC block capacitor will probably destroy them, but may protect the VNA in case of a short circuit. Still, this is not an ideal scenario. Last but not least, we need two 10 kilo ohm resistors in the RF path. We need these because of the internal DC block of our VNA, which together with the external DC block of our BIOS T causes a capacitive voltage divider. This divider would result in a constant voltage being present at the input of the, the VNA. The resistors will dissipate a slowly changing DC current until the large capacitor of the external DC block is full and the internal DC block can no longer be charged. I have here in my hand the complete BIOS T and now we want to go to the lab to do some measurements. Here we will find out why this large capacitor is needed at the DC port. We are now in the laboratory. Here we want to characterize our bias T. First we want to measure the insertion loss of it. For that we have connected port 1 of our VNA with the AC port of our bias T and port 2 with the test pin of our bias T. We measure the insertion loss between 9 kHz and 1 GHz. As you can see, the curve is pretty flat. When we zoom in, we see that the insertion flatness from 9 kHz to 300 MHz is better than 1 dB. Above 300 MHz it gets a little bit worse, but still better than 2 dB. Later for calibration we need the controlled impedance at the DC port. To imitate the impedance of a power supply we have to connect a big capacitor to it. As we can see in our measurement, this will worsen our insertion loss in the lower frequency range a little bit. Next we want to measure the return loss of two equal bias T's. For that we measure S11 parameters at the AC ports, while we have a matched impedance of 50 ohms at the test ports. As we can see, the return loss of the two bias T's over the whole frequency range is pretty similar. Minor differences at higher frequencies are due to variations in the conical inductors. So how do we calibrate for a measurement? As said before, we need capacitors at the DC inputs. We also built our own calibration kit to move the reference plane as near as possible to our device under test.
For calibration, we use the TOSM method. For our measurement, we use the standard inductor as a device under test, connected over to BIOS T2 our VNA and a DC power supply. We measure the S21 parameter and let the VNA calculate the impedance of our device under test over the frequency range. We save the trace and slowly increase the current up to 6 amps. 1 amp, 2 amp, 3 amp, 4 amp, 5 amp and 6 amp. We can see now that the, that the impedance of our device on the test changes. We hope you have enjoyed our presentation and thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them.